Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. I always start by saying you should all consider yourself very privileged. Thank you. And I say this with every sense of it, that there are so many of your country folks who are way below should I say, acceptable living standards. Where you are to be nominated onto this program means you are entering a certain level of responsibility in your various countries. And the first question is, are you happy with what goes on in your country? If not, do you think you can make that difference? Are you in this to serve yourself? Or are you in this to make a difference to what I call the lowest common denominator? I want to say that most countries that we see and love and want to visit have gone through what Africa is going through. But the difference for me is that they were bold enough at a certain stage in their development cycle to say, no, what goes on in our country is totally unacceptable. And therefore, let us do something about it. And that, for me, is where Africa has not yet reached. Post-Second World War, Britain was poor. Britain had virtually lost everything. And Britain had sent one of its most formidable economist, Keynes, I'm sure, You've heard about the Keynesian theory, Keynes to America, John Maynard Keynes. And he was to go seek a loan for $8 billion for the redevelopment of Britain. The Americans said, yes, we will give you a loan, but we will give you $4 billion, but you cannot continue to have an empire. You cannot be broke in your country and yet have an external or external colonies. And that was the beginning. This was in 1945. Subsequent to that, having obtained $4 billion, Britain commissioned what is called the Beverage Report. They took idleness, want, Idleness, all right? Is it prevalent in Africa? Yes. Thank you. Want, in other words, greed. Is it yes. selfishness? Yes. Ignorance? Yes. Disease? Yes. Those were the five ills of society then. And at the end of it, the final decision was that there should be a minimum living standard below which no British or person living in Britain should fall or live below. Are you all with me? In identifying the ills of society, the report put out a recommendation that there must be a minimum standard of life below which no British or person living in Britain should live below. You think we can begin to think like that in Africa? Where the lowest common denominator today lives like 1842 in United Kingdom. That is when 10, 15 people slept in a room. Is it happening in your countries? 
in 2017. And for me, I think that is probably the lowest where human beings, with their freedom, sleep as if they are incarcerated. And yet, all these people have th should have three degrees of freedom with have energy that can be unleashed for Africa's growth. And yet somehow, we, the middle class, have contrived to keep many of our country men and women below recognition. I say those of us in the middle class have contrived because either by your commission or omission, you have allowed the present system to pervade. And for me, that is my greatest worry. There are too many people walking the streets of Accra, Ghana, who could have been and better than Professor Akosa. But unfortunately, their lot is to eke a living on the streets of Accra. What are you, the next leaders of Africa, prepared to do? Do you suffer from want? Not need, but want, greed? Are you selfish? Are you prepared to blight ignorance and disease in your society? And are you prepared to banish idleness from our societies? If not, then I'll say that your period here is not worth it. But if yes, then we can all start the journey towards making it possible. My name is Professor Ajumabe Duakosa. I am a doctor by training. I'm a pathologist by training. Um, I have jumped into, should I say, health systems management. I'm the former director general of the Ghana Health Service, um, former head of pathology in University of Ghana Medical School. For quite a while, I was an adjunct lecturer here in Gimpa because I came here to do the executive masters in governance and leadership. The reason was that I wanted to jump into the political fray. And I felt that as a doctor, never had the opportunity to do government, never had the opportunity to do economics, no legal knowledge, no policy knowledge, nothing. And I felt that it would be very cruel on my part to just jump two feet into politics without that kind of knowledge. So I came here. I was a full professor then, but knowledge you can acquire at any time. But that by itself tells the kind of person you are. Your ability to come down, to be taught either by your contemporaries or people, should I say, who are, probably did not even meet you in university. It was interesting because every lecturer that came, oh, that's what this class there, Professor Akosa is here, every class, you know, just like that. But I'd come to learn. And in the end, I believe I learned a lot. I braved it into the political arena because I wanted to be president of this country. But I immediately realized that politics has no objectivity. Politics in Africa it's not about how well you can persuade people, but how well you can monetize people. Where money is, many, many other things follow. And therefore, yes, about four or five years, I decided to withdraw gradually. Having withdrawn completely, I'm a voice of conscience, and I write articles, and I speak out as and when. But leadership is within. And people say it is a calling. But leadership is within every human being. Those of you who are animal lovers, just look at puppies that have been born. Immediately their eyes open. 
there is a play act for who becomes the leader of the pack. It is within everybody. Everybody strives to become a leader, but most certainly one wins. In every animal sphere, that is what happens. It isn't that all the rest sit down and not bother. They also do whatever they have to do. But eventually, one person, one person, one animal, takes over and becomes a leader. It is important that all of you harness that potential. Because that potential is within you. And I say that if the next generation of African leaders should come from this group, then long when some of us are gone, what we want to hear is that there has been set a minimum standard of life below which no African should be allowed to fall through. So long as that happens, you have no respect. Absolutely no respect. You might respect yourself, but jump out of your country and nobody else respects you. And I think for me, that is probably the greatest indictment ever. You know, I, in 2006, I was invited to a huge African-American forum. It was organized by General Electric, but it had brought most of the high-end African-Americans to Fairfields, which is, should I say, the conference area of General Electric. Very powerful forum. And I had the distinguished honor of speaking before Colin Powell. And one of the things that I said was that in paraphrasing W.E. Du Bois, I said that there is an orchestration such that the brothers and sisters on that side of the Atlantic will not meet the brothers and sisters on the mother continent. There is an orchestration. Because we are being told that our brothers and sisters are all into drugs. Those who do well are in music and in sports. The rest just idle. Is that not the image of the African American that has been portrayed to you? Yes. On the other side, the portrayal is that we are poor, we are lazy. Well, I don't know whether they believe we live on trees, but <laughs> poor, poor, and lazy characterizes us. Now, who would want to meet a druggist, lazy person, at best only into music and sports? Very few people. On the other side, who would want to meet poor, lazy Africans? So, the orchestration is that the two should not meet. Because the energy of the two groups, the rest of the world will not be able to handle it. But somehow, it has been intricately, should I say, like weaving a tapestry. Weaving kente cloth or doing a smock. It has been well woven so that you understand it, they understand it, and we will be separated forever. What I said was that I wish that that conference would be brought to Ghana. Because in Ghana, there are many like me, and many better than me. And that will be, for once, an opportunity for the high-end African Americans to rub shoulders with Africans who are knowledgeable, who are not poor, who are not selfish, who are not greedy, who are not ignorant, and who are prepared to confront the ills of their society and help improve the standard of living of our people. 
how I wish they had heeded my plea and brought the conference here. But you know, when Colin Powell took the stage, the first thing he said was, wow, you guys should have warned me that I'll be speaking after this African boy. We have a lot to prove. All of us, we have a lot to prove. If you want to join the 68% plus or minus two standard deviations that constitute normality, fine. But if you want to be what? The 2.5% that is plus three standard deviations, then you must stand up, be tall, and begin to make your mark in society. You are not young. And as day follows night, and night follows day, the weeks, the months, the years, and you'll be consumed by the normal way of life. And before you're aware, you've got to where we call the big C, the conservative stage in your life where you cannot be radical anymore. Young people, by their nature, must be radical. Young people, by their nature, must want to change the world or change their ecosystem, wherever they are. But somehow, the African youth has been paralyzed by inactivity. We're all into multi-party democracy. But I tell you, the youth are probably even more polarized than we adults. I'd said that if you take the population 8 to 35, they make up 60% of the voting population. So if they put their mind and heart together and say this is what we want, 60%, they've won. Even if 5% of their kind choose to vote for old fugies like myself who have betrayed the essence of our Africanness, you will get 55% and you would win. Are they prepared to do that? No. They are prepared to also play the money game. And that is the greed and the selfishness. So I go back and say, we have not confronted the ills in our society. And until we confront those ills, leadership in Africa will be probably the greatest, the greatest missing link in our growth trajectory. But we must grow. We must. So you young ones have no excuse. And you've been brought here. The beauty of it is, how many countries are here? Nine. Nine. 1945, Kwame Nkrumah and a West Indian called George Padmore co-managed the Pan-African Conference in Manchester, England. At the end of it, Kwame Nkrumah told all the African leaders, Abed Magai, Jomo Kenyatta, Leopold Singer, um, Hufo Boigne, all of them, that the fight is not in Europe, but the fight is in our respective countries. Fighting in Europe would achieve nothing. So we must all organize ourselves and get back to our countries and liberate. That was a cycle of nationalism. The first wave of nationalists who liberated our countries. The next wave is economic emancipation. And who are there to do it? That is where we've lost out. Because that leadership 
that was selfless and devoted to make sure that we do not become colonialists forever. They achieved theirs. And they've gone. All of us suffer from what Bob Marley has said. Mental slavery. And when he says, emancipate yourself from mental slavery, that none but ourselves will free our mind. Are we in that position to free our mind? All of you given an opportunity will probably want to go and live in Connecticut or Maryland or Virginia or New Jersey or New York or Paris or Milan or wherever. Africans are the only society that do not buy from themselves. All other societies, money goes through their society 16 to 18 times before it leaves their society. A Jew will not come and buy something from you. Why? In brother or in sister, they do the same business. You will go there. The same with Indians, the same with Koreans, the same with everybody, except Africans. When they know it's an African shop, ah, oh yeah, they are not going there. They'll go somewhere. Go to Lebanese shop, go to Syrian shop, go to Indian. That's where they'll go and buy. We don't want to grow ourselves. But you know something. About five years ago, a classmate of mine, and we have inched up. We finished medical school in 1979, so we are we're old. We're coming to 40 years as, as doctors, all right? And a mate of mine told me one day, I was speaking at a forum like this, and he happened to be a participant. When he finished, he said, Prof, I think you have too much faith in the African." And I said, what else would you rather have me do? And he said, I'll tell you a story. The first time I heard it, I got mad. But on reflection, I realized that that was the truth. And the story goes like this. As you all know, these kind of stories, God met an American, a British, and a Ghanaian. And God said, I am prepared to do whatever any of you wants, I'll do for you. Anything. Just say it. But before anybody opens their mouth, name your best friend. So everybody named their best friend. And the Lord said, my condition is that whatever you say you want, your friend gets twice that. I see people wins. That is the African thing. The British said, I want one million pounds. And the Lord said, it means your friend Ian gets two million pounds. He said, what the heck? I want one million. What Ian gets has nothing to do with me. So indeed, he gets one million. Ian gets two million. The American said, I want one million dollars. So the Lord said, Jeffrey gets two million dollars. He also said, you asked me what I want. If I wanted two million dollars, I would have said I wanted two million dollars. I want one million. What you give to Jeffrey has nothing to do with me. So the two sealed. Now who can guess what the Ghanaian said? I just want, who can guess? Yes, madam. But what is twice of nothing? nothing? Ah. Nothing is nothing. Twice of nothing is still nothing. Yes. Thank you. The Ghanaian said, Lord, blind me in one eye. So what was going to happen to his friend? The African knowingly 
will not assist anybody to be better than them. But life is not like that. If you have children and they haven't done better, then you have a problem. I have two children. My boy is a doctor. He's in Yale at the moment. I didn't go to Yale. Whatever he's doing there must be doing better than I did. My daughter is a fine chick. She's a barrister. She's a barrister, yeah? And, you know, doing some interesting dynamics. I have contributed a little bit, but I'm the 10th born of my mother. And everybody, when I go back home, everybody says, ah, you, your mother, 10th born. You, man, how many? Two. My father, I'm the 21st of my father. I thought you asked me of how many? <laughs> of 106. With 39 women. With 39 women. And I said to myself, what about the women that he did not have children with? All right? 39, he had issues with them. What about those he, he didn't have children with? That man... In all his circles, you know, I have perfected a phrase that says, he is bien connu. Bien connu. He is a well-known man. And all of us go back to our hometown and people just look at us and say, you people are apologies of your father. Yes. But you see, my father had said something. That one day, you see the worst of a large family. On the 4th of August, we are meeting for the 25th anniversary of the man. And all children, all grandchildren, and all great-grandchildren are expected to arrive in Ashanti Mampong. That is, that is where that young man comes from. Fifi and Ponsan. That's, right. That's where he comes from. He's my nephew. You understand? For my father, it was leadership, but leadership through biology. <laughs> everybody. Everybody. But you see, because he worked hard, he did that. And he did not only look after his children, he virtually educated the entire community. He educated the entire community. And my father was known to have told a former governor of the Bank of Ghana that, hey, if I had been selfish and kept my money to myself, you would not be the governor of the Central Bank of Ghana. As governor of the central bank, you have not even taken one person, even within your larger family, to educate. Spend your time and your money, look after your wife and children, and you'll be gone. And since that man died, nobody remembers him. Nobody remembers him. If you do not leave your footprints in the sands of time, you've lost out. I have come with what I called my own hypothesis. That all of us are brought into this world by the good Lord. Or Allah if you're a Muslim. Anybody who in death becomes more popular than while she was alive did everything that the good Lord wanted him to do. You believe it? So Jesus Christ is more popular now than he had ever been. My, I'm a protege of a surgeon for Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. He is much more popular now than he was when he was alive. In Africa, probably the only person you might mention is, a, is Man, Nelson Mandela. Beyond that, who else? Patrice Lumumba, yes. But Patrice Lumumba, because he died very early. Until we begin, and again, you see, 
This is part of our mental slavery. If Africans would read, everybody would have known who Patrice Lumumba was. But that for me is a hypothesis. Are you prepared to become popular when you're dead than when you're alive? That means you've got to be selfless. That means you have got to empathize with people. Are you prepared to do that? If you're prepared to do that, then Africa has a fighting chance. If you guys are not prepared to do that, then my word. Because those venomous vipers are plenty. They will suck everybody's blood. Whatever money they have, they, have, they would want more. The way our people live, I've said, does not endear us to respect. One of the things that I know that you know, you've been doing health. One of the things that should be the aspiration of all of us is universal coverage of health. Because health is a fundamental thing. If you lack health, you lack everything. The ability for everybody to access any aspect of the health service free at the point of service delivery is what should be one of our major aspirations. But for me, it starts from the health of African women in the reproductive age group. In Ghana, we're talking almost 59% of them are anemic. And that is a proxy for malnutrition. If 59%, almost 60% of our women between the ages of 15 to 45 are anemic, then they will be got children who are malnourished too. The good Lord in his wisdom made sure that no matter your nutritional status, he will squeeze the best nutrients into your breast milk so that your baby can have as near the best as is possible. But the child starts with a deficit. So I tell all the men, if you choose your spouse, one of the first things you have got to make sure is that her nutritional deficiencies are resolved. Because if you want your children to be strong, if you want your children to be smart, if you want your children to be intelligent, your mother's nutritional status becomes crucial. And there is a hypothesis again, Barker's hypothesis, that says that you are your mother's health. Poorly nourished mothers will give birth to those who in future who have what we call the non-communicable diseases, the hypertensions and the diabetes and all those diseases. And the reason is that in your mother's womb, you got little bits of food because your mother's nutritional status is poor. But as soon as you're born, your mother believes that the only way to get you to eat is to give you porridge loaded with sugar. The more sugar you put in that porridge, the worse it is for the child in future. If you don't give sugar to the child, the child will never miss it in their lives. And for those of you who have not started having children, try it. Do not. Refined sugar is probably the greatest threat after tobacco. Now that at least we've been able to ban smoking in public places, the next should be refined sugar. And whether it's white, whether it's brown, whether it's yellow, same, 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 same. Because what it does is that it adds almost a calorie overload. 
The African eats too much carbohydrate. When you ask an African, what do you eat? Say, ah, na eba or yam or rice. You ask the Caucasian, what did you have for lunch? Chicken, beef, steak, whatever. You see where our priorities are? Because we, we do our food double-decker. <laughs> Rice is the ground floor. The stew is the second floor. And then a little bit of meat is the third floor. No vegetable. There are some places where they eat vegetable, yes. But if it's yam, ground floor. The stew sauce, you know, that's what we eat. We have got to fill ourselves with the carbohydrate. So, we in Africa, even biologically, you see, the world is stuck against us. Ghana, since 1988, we have reduced malnutrition amongst our under fives from about 60 to almost 40% now. The world now knows that by day 1000, that is, from your mother's womb to two years on the surface of this earth, if your nutritional problems are not resolved, you have an impairment in your brain infrastructural development. So you have irreversible cognitive, diminished cognitive ability. But even worse than that, you have diminished physical ability to work. And as I speak, they've just done a cost of hunger in Africa study. And in Ghana, 5.5 million adults walking the surface of this country were malnourished as children. Tell them not to put litter here, and they'll put litter. It's almost as if two words and they've forgotten the first one. <laughs> or two sentences, and they have forgotten the first one. It's, it's a laughable matter. But that is the level to which we have sunk. I've just finished doing an article, The Lowest Common Denominator. And I start the article, Who am I? I'm no one. Where do you live? Nowhere. Where do you sleep? The sky is usually my roof. Where do you bath? Open space. Where do you defecate? Open defecation. How many of you sleep together? Plenty of us. Boys and girls? Yes, the girls sleep, you know, a short distance away. But they are troubled by boys all the time. That is the living standard of a lot of Africans. Those of us in positions don't care where they sleep. They don't know. They are on the streets every day. Where they've come from has nothing to do with us. They haven't washed. They are on the streets, what, inhaling exhaust fumes. And somehow, we think that it is good for us, middle class, sit in my car, rolled, I've pressed the icon, and I'm there. We have contrived that the next generation will be poorer than us. I just chanced on some statistics that I have put in my article. 15 to 35 year olds in Ghana who are unemployed. 15 to 35 year olds, that is youth unemployment. 13.9% of them, no schooling. We're talking 2017. No schooling. So from 15 to 35, if you have no school, what can you do in today's life? 29.9% of them did not finish 
basic school. In other words, did not complete JHS, as they call it here. 33.2% of them finished JSS, but no more. So 70% of the youth unemployed in this country below or up to JSS. And you ask yourself, even with the best intention in the world, what can you do for them? What can you do for somebody who in today's world has not even completed basic, what is BECE, basic education certificate examination. Thank you. I was way past that, before that one arrived, you know. I went to primary school, I did common entrance, I passed common entrance and I went to, you know, for the Ghanaians here, I went to Prempa College, so I'm an imam for, I'm an imam for. Proud of it, man. <laughs> forever, forever proud of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you see, I did sixth form in another school, and they call themselves the giants. So look at me, one man, I'm a mom for, I'm a giant. You know, you, you, must, you, must, you must do well in society. You must, you must, you must do well. I have brought all these predicaments of our society because I believe that you people are the ones who are going to step onto the bridge and say, we're going to do it. I don't hear the willingness. Are you going to do it? Yes. You're going to solve the nine countries problem? Yes. If you say yes, I believe you. If you say I believe you. Because not to solve it, your own life will be in jeopardy. All of us, our walls are six feet. We've got electric fences on them. We've got, you know, burglar proof. All right? What? Uh, 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 everything. You are a prisoner in your home. It's like the prisoner telling the jailer that don't call me a prisoner. You are a warder in the prison. I wear uniform, you wear uniform. We are here surrounded by barbed wire. You two, you are inside. You understand? We may get away with it because the anger the anger amongst the youth has not, you know, hasn't come up. But the more we deny people of what is fundamentally basic life, one day something might give. And I pray to God that we can touch their lives before. So, for all of you, I say, let's go back to the beverage report. Idleness, want, selfishness, ignorance, disease. All this are rife. 5.5 million people who were malnourished as children, they are as ignorant as hell. But they drive taxis. They drive... Uh, what, bench 207, the sprinters, they are drivers, they are mates, they are kayaye, they are sellers of plantain, they are sellers of sachet water, all of them. Huge population. Two sentences and you've lost them. You know, I was distributing, as director general, I was distributing insecticide treated nets. You know what? Insecticide treated nets are used for? Yeah. Bed nets, yes. And we were doing a child welfare week, and it was free for children under five. So mothers, you know, with children under five got it free. And there's a woman who came with a son. Now you look at the son's face, and you know this child is about eight years. 
But in terms of stature, this child is like three years. And I told the mother that, no, 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 this child is more than five years, so you won't get net. She pestered me, pestered me, pestered me. Eventually, I gave her a net. And as soon as she held the net, she told me, I'm going to sell it and go and buy Guinness to drink. You see how the child is? I told the mother, if you don't spend time for your baby, this baby will never spend time for you. Already, the child is stunted. You want the child to get malaria too? This child can never do well in school. Cannot be like you guys. Top notch. You know? Top 10 percentile. No. In the end, he's either going to be a little minion. My take to what? Pushing drugs or whatever. And this boy will be in and out of prison and you the mother in your hour of need this child will not be there. Africa is in its hour of need. Truly. Africa. It's not only the nine countries that are represented here. Entire Africa is in its hour of need. Who is prepared to step on the bridge and say we will deliver Africa. I want to put that charge on you here. As part of this leadership empowerment that it is your responsibility to get Africa out of the woods. Being selfless should not be too difficult. Because you might end up being popular in death than in life. You might chuckle and think you're dead. But let me tell you, when I was in secondary school, I happened to be walking in Kumasi to the central market area. And somehow people tell me I look like my dad. An old man just met me and said, Hey, young man, do you come from Mampong? I said, yes. Is your father Mr. Akosan? I said, yes. He said, hey, your father is tough. <laughs> you understand? And I think that statement, he has said it all. Your father is tough. Just instant recognition, that was the man's parting statement. Way in Koforodia, in the days of General Kutua Champo, we were the student leaders at that time. And I was out, you know, doing what student leaders did at that time. And I was to go and hand over documents to, you know, no, at that, no, no, at that time I was there. This was 1980. No, 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 not 1980. The champion was, no, this was 77. I'd gone to Kofodia, and I'm sure you know the late, the late Dr. Taylor. Yes. Dr. Taylor was to meet me at the Kofodia STC station. So as soon as I got there, I came out. He met me. I had things inside my shirt, you know, and I handed over the things to him. And then I went back to pick the next to Kumasi because the next stop for me was Kumasi. And I was boarding the bus. Another man saw me and said, Ah, hey, do you come from Mampong? And I said, Ah, in far away Kofodia too. <laughs> Kumasi is close to where I come from. But Kofodia is miles. And he said, Hey, Mr. are you Mr. Kusan's son? I said, Yes. I said, Hey, as for your father, this is where we call the term Biakonu. Biakonu, that's well known in French, you understand? Biakonu, you are known. Konu is to know. 
All right? And Bian is well. So we put it together. Well known. Bian Kanu. And I think that by the stretch of his children and grandchildren and great grandchildren, even long when we are gone, we will not be the ones who will be remembered. But it's that man who will be remembered. Are you prepared to be popular in death than alive? then the charge is for you. If we don't redeem Africa, if we don't take ourselves from mental slavery, then Africa will forever be where it is. It will be treated with disdain and everybody can have a go at us. I listened to a lecture quite recently, the new Kwame Nkrumah Chair of African Studies in the University of Ghana. This man comes from the West Indies. And his inaugural lecture dated back to the Ghana Empire and the Songa Empire and all that. And as he spoke, he brought it into contemporary life. He said, Lake Chad, Lake Chad used to be one of the largest lakes in the world. We have all sat down for Lake Chad to dry up. Meanwhile, it is not a million miles away from one of the largest rivers in DR Congo. And all we could do was do a canal and divert water into Lake Chad. You go to Britain. And the whole country is linked by canals. These were man-made canals. They were dug. And the canals created. So you can sit in, a can not a canoe, but, you know, a yacht. And on Sunday, ride through the Thames and just go on the canals and just have a wonderful time. Today, in Ghana, our rivers are all drying up. All it requires is a volunteer force because the bare earth, if you go to England, the only bare earth you see is in somebody's garden. A lie? Those of you who've been there, nowhere would you see the bare earth. Ghana, as soon as it rains, all the topsoil, erosion, and all of that goes into the rivers and all the silt has sedimented and now the rivers are no more. If we had a volunteer force ready to dig and use that sand even for the construction industry because a lot of builders tell me the best sand for building is what is it called? Alluvial. Well, there you are. That is mined from the riverbed. We could have all our rivers with a huge column to make for sustainable agriculture throughout the year in Africa. Are we prepared to do it? No. Any young man today, any young man today, if you ask them to do anything, oh yeah, no money. Yes. But is that Africa's salvation? Of course not. So, young people, I have tried today to weave through Africa's predicaments. If I start talking about education, at least I have said that 15 to 35 year olds in Ghana, 77% of them have a raw deal. Britain made secondary education compulsory in 1902. So, everybody there reads paper. Everybody. Everybody. So, when you're talking multi-party democracy, whatever you're talking, the person can understand. Or at least can hold a thread in it. You don't need to give money to anybody to vote for you. Talk. What will you do? That is the issue-based politics, the defining moment in the politics there. 
here. My brother. All right? Then, boom, you get the money. Then, as soon as you go and somebody else comes and that person brings you even more, then, hey, you're on the other side. It doesn't develop the country. It really doesn't develop the country. But I have said that somehow it is the responsibility of the youth to bridge the African-American divide and let your brothers and sisters on the other side of the continent feel emboldened to take the next logical step to come here. It is in Africa's interest but it is even more in their own interest. You know Trevor Noah, the South, Amer the South African comedian? He said, hey, before the American elections, eh, every black man we see, you say, hey, Trevor, where do you come from? South Africa. I said, take me to the motherland, man. All the black Americans wanted to come to Africa. Trump wins, and today, the white people to meet him and said, Trevor, where do you come from? He said, South Africa. I said, take me there. <laughs> take me there. Africa is the next continent of opportunity. Everything is lacking here. But it is not to go to China and go and bring the worst of whatever is manufactured there. It is to sit in Africa and begin to put things together. We've got sand. We've got clay. We've got stones. What in God's name can't we do? Why should we build houses? And when I was building my house, I went to China. I admit, I went to China. But every... every you know, in Ghana, it's not saying every, they say evil, 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 evil thing. They say that, they don't speak the language properly, and when you say they should spell it, then it becomes a problem. Good morning, morning. Uh, so, yes, I brought everything. And, like I said, we all live six foot wall, what, electric car wires and everything. I suffer from that. But I have even gone further than that. I like dogs. So I've got 21 dogs in my house. I like them. 21. Every evening, I take two for a walk. Every evening, I take two of them go for a walk. Everybody in that, everybody in that lane knows that as well as man's house, if you enter. <laughs> if you enter, the dogs will have you for snack. Because, of course, they would have eaten. But they will have you for snack. Right? No, I like animals. So, that is, that, is, that, is, that is the essence of it. But, we have a task. And nine countries connect. Like I was talking about 1945 Manchester Conference in Pan-Africa. They met there. Today, you guys are here. Get to know yourselves. This is a court. You had six courts. Can you imagine if all the six courts are still in link and in discussion of where Africa is going next? It will not be too difficult to solve Africa's problem. If Obama did nothing for Africa, this YALI program has brought people from nine countries together. Young people with energy, vitality, full of beans, as they say. And all you've got to do is come together, grow Africa. Grow Africa. Africa, there's so much to be done. And even at my age, I'm still thinking of so many things to do. So many things to do. When I lived in England, I had an English acquaintance. I, you, you never want to believe that an Englishman becomes a friend of an African. I, 
And, you know, I'm the first doctor in my family. But from his great, 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 great grandfather was the first editor of The Lancet, which is one of the best medical journals. So as far back as 16 something, he had doctors in his family. And David said, Kofi, so long as you stay here, you can never be like me. Well, I'm in your country, oh. I came to learn. I don't intend to stay here. So I left. Not because of what he said. I achieved whatever I wanted to achieve. And I came here. And on my 39th birthday, I was appointed professor of pathology. And I pride myself as probably the youngest professor appointed by the University of Ghana Medical School. By the, by the University of Ghana, not University of Ghana Medical School. And you see, you take your chances. And wherever you are, let your voice be heard. Now I say I am a voice of conscience. I've just done three articles the week. I go through what I call bets of writing. The first one is the lowest common denominator. And I talk about beverage report and all those things. The one I just finished today is Ghana retires at 60. 60 is our retirement age. Ghana is 60. So Ghana has retired. People who have served this country 35 to 40 years of unalloyed service end up pensions of 500, 600, 700, 800, even the best of them will get about 1,500 CDs. And my contention is that you can't survive one week, two weeks on that. So for all the services to God and country, that is how much you get. So Ghana is going to get that. And we see how Ghana is going to survive. The government says, I can only pay you this salary. But then the same government turns around and says, I am a liberal, free market economy, so I cannot determine prices. So go to the market, and whatever the market people say, charge, pay. But when it comes to my salary, you say what? It is ability to pay. Government, employers, trade unions, go and meet to decide the minimum wage of this country. And the minimum wage is eight CDs a day. It means one CD an hour. I don't know how many sachet waters one CD can buy. Sachet water is what? 20p? Five. If he buys kinky, he can't buy anything else. One ball of kinky. My God. We treat our own people so shabbily. And so as soon as you get to pension age, in less than five years, most of them are dead and die out of poverty and misery. And yet, they've devoted their time to God and country. We should begin to change the dynamics. We should begin to change dynamics. In my article on the lowest common denominator, I ended up tongue-in-cheek that the wealth of the three ex-presidents of this country can make the lives of the lowest common denominators better. But would they? Of course not. They don't, they don't give a damn. But that is the price we pay for electing people who do not think about us but make us believe, it's a make believe, that indeed they think about us. Africa's hands is in your hands. Africa's life, its existence is in your hands. How you want to treat it will determine how Africa goes forward. If you want to snuff it, well and good. But if you want to grow it, 
than it requires selfless, exemplary leadership. Leadership is cause. Everything is effect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prof. I'm really inspired by your speech. Uh, my question is, I know how some of us Ghanaians, majority of Ghanaians and even Africa, react to people who have very strong opinions about very sensitive issues like you do. So I want to know the reaction of people to your articles, the kind of things you've been writing about. How has the response been so far? And also, um, can you maybe give us the address to your website or blog or so we can take a read? Thank you very much, Prof. I'm, I'm Douglas from Ghana, but I also want to say that we are not going to change only the nine countries, but the whole of Africa. Um, what I want to ask you is that you said you realize politics is not about objectivity. So you are almost withdrawing. What advice will you give to a youth who is here and wants to go into politics to help change the lives of the common African? Will you advise that he should also withdraw or they should, we should persist? Thank you very much. I, I, I write for graphic, so if you go uh, www.graphic.com.gh and put Professor A.B. Akosa, you will get a deluge of articles. Let me just put it that way. I, I don't blog. All right? I'm not a 2017's man. I'm not a blogger. All right? As far as the reaction, a lot. So somebody met me somewhere and said, Prof, do you have a lot of money? And I said, why? And he said, you speak as if you don't need help from anybody. That is the kind of response that I get. I'm rich in my head. And I'm proud of that. Yeah. But I don't believe that I'm in need because I have worked hard in my life. And I am one of those who, in the article on pensions, I, I'm now advising people. I've got a farm, all right? I've got a farm. I've got animals, you know? I've got, so Christmas Day is my birthday. So you can imagine that throughout the year, I would probably not do much on the farm, but Christmas Day, I will kill a bull, give half to my family, Mampong, bring half to Accra. I'll have two sheep, two goats, two pigs, bring to Accra. All from my farm. Don't spend one peswa. You understand? I grow vegetables. So when I go to Mampong and I'm coming, I bring vegetables. There are so many things that all of us Africans can do to make our lives better. But somehow we don't. If you want to go to the market every day, you'll be part of the poor man's syndrome. You understand? So my richness is in my head and my diversity, the kind of things that I do. You understand? Young man, Many brave souls must enter the political fray. You need a critical mass of young people, selfless and devoted to the African cause, to get into that space. But if you go there alone, you'll be hunted down. If you've watched National Geographic and you see how predators go out to hunt, the first thing they do is to ostracize a few of the animals from their pack and they become the prey to be attacked. If we're alone and you speak like I do, 
you'll be ostracized. Everybody in this country, every government that comes, somebody will call me and say, oh, prof, your name was mentioned. Not that I want to accept any position from anybody. But people believe I am too independent in my mindset and in the way I speak that no government or nobody has the confidence to meet up with me. I'm happy. I don't need that. And therefore, it won't stop me from what I do. You understand? But I say, before you can get to that level, you should have also built yourself up and that confidence. I tell people, speak if they suck you. You turn round and 200 doors are open to you. But the typical African is paralyzed and therefore will not speak out because he or she thinks that if he's sucked or sucked, there'll be nowhere to go. But I believe sincerely, you turn round and you'll be amazed. You will say, why wasn't I pushed out sooner? Thank you. Um, I'm very elated with the words you've shared with me. My name is Eva and I'm Ghanaian. I want to know your take on the winner take all system in, the, in most of our African continent and the recommendations you have to make. And I will equally want to know um, what your take is on the national health insurance scheme in, in relation to the kind of disease that they cover. Because yesterday was Down syndrome day and nothing has been said about it. But what we focus on is malaria and other minor diseases. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Prof. Uh, that was quite inspiring. Um, I want to know, um, you transform, ah, sorry, I'm Lambert from Cameroon. Um, I'm a, a public health physician. So you transformed from medical practice and into politics and it's something you do so well. But after have gotten that training, which is so important, and um, the county needs you that much to, to do the practical work, do you not feel guilty somehow that you are not there um, in practice? Though what you do is very important. And I'm just giving now the second question with my colleague who gave me, whether do you foresee the universal health coverage as something very practical? Thanks. government presents a manifesto and based on that they bribe the people to vote but let's assume that the people vote for them what I detest is that the party is so strong that the party does not allow the president the free hand pick people. When Obama won and became president of America and he started appointing people, the first thing people said is, this man must be extremely confident because he was appointing couples, couples, people who were like there in their own area, sphere of influence. Your ability to bring all those solid people together and lead them is a mark of confidence. So I say that, unfortunately, those who become presidents don't have that confidence to be able to tell their party that I won the election. Yes, the party did whatever, but it was my name that went forward. And any mishap, it is my name that goes down the tubes. And therefore, I will select the best in this country to lead. It has nothing to do with the winner take all. Nothing. But we see we blame a system. We blame a system. If we, you see, even within the parties themselves, again, go to, through their primaries and the kind of things that they go through for people to win, it certainly doesn't bring out the best 
in our system. So for me, the problems are not up there, but the problems are part of the system. And if we can tweak it, the day that there will be a bold, you know, young man, who was the young man who asked Douglas? Yes. The day someone like Douglas will mount the rostrum and win the, com I, I, I like the word confiance, you know. Uh, it's a, it's, a, it's a, a street word meaning confidence. You know, the confiance of the people. Then that, that, that for me will be the acid test. You turn back and tell the party that I want to deliver on my mandate and I will pick the best in this country. If you can't harvest the intellectual might of this country, we're not going anywhere. All right? National health insurance. As for that, I was... Interestingly, part of the genesis, but because of myself, I was taken out. 17th February 2001. Was it 2001? I'd written an article on health insurance. And that was probably the only article that I have had response. The then deputy minister called me for a chat. And I had said to the incoming MPP government that the NDC piloted national health insurance and have come out openly to say it will not work. But I said, the new government should be bold enough because it will work. You don't do things and go to Denmark and Norway and go and learn their systems and not take your African context. All right? And that was part of the difficulties of national insurance. In terms of coverage, you know, the burden of disease is very high. The burden of disease is very high. And in so many ways, it is only a national health insurance that will work. Because if you insure 10 people, in Denmark, only four people will go to hospital out of the 10. And probably none of them will do a repeat. In Ghana, if you insure 10 people, nine will go to hospital, seven will do a second repeat, and about four will go in and out all the time. It is not a self-financing mechanism. It's got to be sustained, you know, through many, many other ways. As for the coverage, you can never cover all health diseases. Can never, never. Particularly, and I say this that, yes, nobody chooses the disease. But if, for example, you are found to have a certain disease. The government should be able to say that we've come this far. One of my brothers had chronic kidney disease. And since I am, my son is not here, so I'm the only doctor. You know, we had a conference. And I said, he has one son. Whatever monies we need to go dialyze Charles, let's put that money and educate his son. Because the dialysis won't cure him. And you do dialysis forever and make everybody poor. And in the end, he will die. So, off. Two and a half weeks, Charles was gone. His son is now in university. So, anybody can blame me and say, did you do the right thing or did you do the wrong thing. I didn't give Charles the chronic kidney disease. But once he had gotten it, I had to make a very, you know, and that is what I did. All right? Now, <laughs> why? Pardon? Oh, yes, it's an ethical dilemma. But when you know, you, you, give, you give the best advice. You give the best advice. I mean, if it happens to me, I'll tell them, quit it. Don't spend money. I've done my bit, man. I've done my bit to society. 
So for me, right now, give me another, how many? Once I get to 65, I'm waiting to be 65. And from there, it's just the, the sweet things of life. The sweet things in life. Pardon? I don't know. <laughs> you know, a friend of mine was asked this question. I said, oh, I am one in Sunny man in your You know, when a friend of mine was asked, you know, and he said, oh, so how? I said, oh, well, cool. I said, so what's happening? I said, well, this world is rice and meat representing food. All right? Drinks, women, and music. The women can substitute women for men if they choose to. But as for us, a morning nam and Sunday morning yum. That's all. I still have eight children to bring forth before I reach my. I'm the tenth of my mom. Who says I'm serious? Huh? All I've got to do is just create a trust to look after them. Don't worry. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm, I, I think I'm, I'm, I'm past that. But you never can be certain, you know. I'm my father's son, for Christ's sake. Yes, sir. Um, yours was. Oh, no, no, no. I, let me tell you, I, I am a pathologist, all right? I'm a cellular pathologist. And I have a laboratory that I sit most afternoons and report on slides. In this country, all the histology from all the private hospitals come to my lab. So I'm still deep in the medical fraternity. Um, I think in, in May, we're having a public lecture, all right? And I... When I was president of the medical association, I inst instituted a public lecture, all right? So I will be speaking on health systems management in Ghana. So I still give to the health profession. I'm not uh, 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 done in and out. I mean, I sit coolly and report, you know, histology, which is my first love in medicine. Okay, I don't go and do autopsy, no. I mean, I've trained too many people to want to go and do autopsy. Unless, of course, the case is such that somebody will say, this one there, please, professor. Then I'll say, if you are prepared to pay 50,000, yeah, then, because I don't, I don't want to do it. So I put out big money just to scare people. So yeah. <laughs> you understand? And then the thing was universal coverage. I mean, that should be our attainment. That should be our desire that everybody can access hospital free at the point of service delivery. And by service, I mean primary health care. I don't think people should just get up and go to a teaching hospital. I don't even think people should get up and go to a regional hospital. Go to a district hospital, go to a, poly, a polyclinic, access, and when you are referred, then you are referred. If we did that, the number of referrals that will go to a regional hospital will be about 10%. And the number that will go to a teaching hospital will be 10% of that 10%, 1%. If you do that, then uh, national health insurance will be sustained. But today, everybody can walk to a hospital. Go to Kol if you go to Kolobu for hypertension, and you've done that for one year, Kolobu should be able to say, go back to Mamobi Polyclinic for your chronic review. You don't need to be coming to the teaching hospital. You understand? So for me, that, that, that is, that is the, 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 the real crust. Um, good evening. Uh, thank you so much, Prof. My name is Isaac Jaban from the Gambia. Um, I'm a medical doctor. Uh, I think I couldn't just hold it back, but just see how much inspired I am um, for the fact that you are a medical doctor and also um, so balanced in terms of leadership and politics. I want to ask two questions. The first one is, considering the, the nature of medical training um, and the number of years it takes to finish and specialize, uh, what will be your advice to a young doctor like me who has a passion for medicine but also has a passion for leadership and politics? Number two, um, 
like you just um, dived into the issue, yeah, just before I took the mic, is the issue that in Africa, um, our health system is not functioning effectively. And I think primarily because our primary health um, system is not functioning. Uh, for example, if you're in the US or in the UK, uh, they have a very strong, effective primary health system. Every family have their own JPs. And that helps to put the health system more effective. What do you think we can do really in this regard? Thank you so much. Good evening, Prof. My name is Wally. I'm from Togo. I just wanted to add an idea. You quoted Dubois when you started. Um, regarding the issue of the African American there, there is some, I mean, a kind of I mean, analysis that we'll have to understand. When you take, for example, the issue of the Black History Month, that's changing African American History Month, which is a kind of, an, I mean, issue to separate the African Americans and the we Africans here in Africa, which is also another issue to continue with the same steps of uh, Booker T. Washington's Tuskegee. So, Professor, I just wanted to ask you this question. We, Africans that are here, does it mean that we are a bit different from them? And the second one is that when you go, for example, in Togo, our professors that are here at the university there, what you are doing here, they are not doing the same thing there. So, we, the young leaders that are coming, we have some kind of difficulties to attend, to do what you are doing here. Because they are not doing the same thing there in order to teach us. So what can we do as young leaders in order to overcome this? Thank you so much. Thank, thank you very much. Um, medical profession, what I say is that whatever your primary profession aspire to be the best in it. As you become the best in your chosen profession, it leads you into leadership. It leads you straight into leadership. Leadership comes as a result. I just showed that when puppies are playing, they are all playing, but somehow one emerges as the leader. When I went to UK, the top position, if you are not in the academic realm as a consultant. So I told myself, I'll be a consultant here before I go home. Luckily for me, I trained in the Royal Postgraduate Medical School, Amosme Hospital. I pride myself that it's the best hospital in the world in terms of academics. So I was fortunate. I became a consultant, but I became an honorary senior lecturer at the where I was graduate medical school. And then I became an honorary reader in the UK, that is associate professor, before I came to Ghana. So I had that to trade in to be appointed here. Once you've done that, you have built your self-confidence. All right? For me, it doesn't matter where I speak. I know that whatever I say, challenge it. That is your problem, not my problem. Because, because of what you've been able to do and the self-confidence you've attained, you read. I read. I'm not the typical, you know, African. They say if you want to hide something from an African, put it in a book or write it down. I read. I read. In my bag, I have a book I'm reading. My bedside... I have a book I'm reading. So I read. If you don't read about somebody's life, how do you share experience? And there are many great people. The Africans don't buy biographies. They don't buy even storybooks to read. You know, what do they, they spend their money in church. Please. That's all they do. You go and give money to pastor. And pastor... He gets money on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And by the next Sunday, they have not even finished counting the previous week. My friend, keep the money and go and buy a book and read. <laughs> educate, educate yourself. 
so that you can stand tall. You understand? So once you have that confidence moving into, you know, lateralizing becomes relatively easy. All right? So for me, yes, once you've chosen to do medicine, what specialty do you want to do? Go at it with a blast and aim. One of the things that people don't do, and I should tell my children, set your goal every five years. You take it, you've achieved it. Then you set a, a bigger goal. All right? So I went to the UK as what? a young African boy. I get there. I go to the Hammersmith. I do my diploma course. And in doing it, I made sure that all the lecturers there recognized me. You understand? Because I speak in class, because I read. So when I ask questions, all right, even if you know the answer, ask the question. And let, yes, yes. And let, let, let them answer, you know, because I, I remember I just finished, we just finished a diploma program. They had uh, uh, a dinner. They had a, a cocktail for the diploma program. And Professor Galton asked me, young man, where do you come from? I said, I come from Ghana. And he said, how do you find the course? And I said, it's easy. You know? He said, what did you say? I said, the course is easy. He said, why? I said, the textbook, Postgraduate Hematology, is written by 10 professors and senior lecturers all in this hospital, all right? The first time in my life that I'm reading a textbook and I know the people who wrote it. What is the difficulty? If I don't understand, I'll come to your office. <laughs> and, 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 and honestly, the man just looked at me. I mean, you are doing physics. You're reading Abbott. Do you know Abbott? Nelko and Parker. Do you know them? I don't know anybody. But even there, we survived, though. Here. Here, you, Professor Galton, you are there. Ah, why? <laughs> why? And, you know, the man took me as a friend till I left Hammerson. You understand? Because he felt that, gee, what a boy. <laughs> you understand? That's life. That's life. Don't let anybody eclipse you. No, 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 no. You go there, the typical African, timid, 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 no. no. It, it will not do anything for you. Breathe yourself. All right? And, 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 and you, 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 people, some of your contemporaries will not like you for that. But you are not in life because of them. No. So leave them, leave them by the side. I mean, Africans and African Americans. I would say we were the survivors of the raid. If it had only been the raid and not the colonialism that came after that, I think Africa would not be where it is. When the whites finally decided that no, they are not coming to take slaves away. They are coming to come and control us here, it came with racism. It came with putting you down as an inferior being. And I think that is what has really paralyzed us. Those who went there, there was a selection because those who fell sick died were thrown overboard. Those who got there, got beaten in their system, did not survive. Somehow, some of them survived. So, they are, in a sense, you would put them, if you do a thoroughbred, a thoroughbred they are there. But unfortunately, they face a system of racism up to today. And that is why the black lives matter has come about. Unfortunately for us in Africa, we have allowed our own people 
to today become political leaders and plunder us. So, in a sense, we have a shared relationship. And you can put it either side of the same spectrum. We stayed here. A lot of people are not exposed. If you go to the village, you ask the, in, in, in my article on the lowest common denominator, I asked the question, why are, you in Afri- why are you in Accra? And the response was that because Ghana is Accra. Where he comes from, there's no light. There's nothing. So what is he going to achieve? His parents, his grandparents before them were peasant farmers and they have absolutely nothing to show for it. Absolutely nothing to show for it. Why should I stay in the village and be a peasant farmer too? And not have anything to show for it? You understand? So, in a sense, we have allowed if I had become president of Ghana, I would have said Accra, Kumasi, all the cities, you are not getting one Pesua from the government of Ghana. Start your property taxation and use that money to run the city. And the money that will come to Accra, Kumasi and all that will be support for the rural economy. And the rural economy, well, now they are saying one district, one factory. I hope it happens. What it means is that look at every place and look at their comparative advantage. Eastern region. The reason why Kwame Nkrumah set up the, the Nsawam cannery was because, look at the whole of Eastern region. From so many mangoes, come to Oda oranges, pineapple, kominini is just there. So you could virtually bring all this, can it, desiccate it, and so on and so forth. What we need is farm gate activity. If all the cassava was brought to farm gate, cut, washed, cut into half a kilo, one kilo, two kilos, 1.5 kilos, five kilo bags, vacuumed, all right? They are vacuum uh, extractors. Once you put something in a bag and you put it in, it draws all the air and seals it. And once it seals, that thing will be in that state forever until you cut it. So when you are transporting cassava, you are transporting what? Cassava in half kilo bags, so and so and so. Yeah, the same thing. All the peels become food for remnants. All right? So plantain, yam, cassava peels, and all that. You can use that. If it's uh, um, gari you're doing, you are greeting at the farm gate. If it is mangoes, you are juicing at the farm gate. You're juicing. Or you are cutting and desiccating, drying it. If we did that, there would be a lot of work for our rural, you know, brothers and sisters. They would not have to come. If you go to America, the farmers all produce their milk, all right, put it in refrigerated flasks, and the big companies come. As soon as they come, they will supply you with their refrigerator flask. All right? So 200 liters, they come, they just put the, this thing on it, pump it into the big refrigerated van, and they leave you with all this thing for your following day. That farmer doesn't have to take anything anywhere. You understand? So if you had oranges, by the time the oranges are loaded, they are harvested, they are loaded, they are brought to Aboboshi. Uh, before anybody sell, half of it is rotten. So there, there, is, there are opportunities here in this country. But the sense is not there. Sense is not there. So, you know, this is, this is, this is our Africanness. But I tell you, in our own way, some of us are doing some of these things. You know, I don't like fruit juice as such. I like to make alcohol out of fruit juice. <laughs> and the reason why I want to make alcohol out of fruit juice, and this is, this is my entrepreneur secret. 
if you want to do it, wherever you are, you can do it. For me, I share. I had a British breast pathology expert, Professor Davies. He used to visit me when I was here as head of department. And I went to his house to visit him. And he gave me something to drink. And when I tasted it, I said, Ian, this is like nothing that has gone on my palate. When you're, when you're speaking to them, you've got to speak to them in their own language. You've got to virtually hold your, your English and, and display it. You're not going to speak African English. <laughs> Open your mouth. And this is like nothing that has hit my palate before. And he said, I do this myself. I do it myself. So I went down to his cellar with him. And I went and saw that in myself. And he said, it's so easy. And yet, the output, brilliant. So when I came to Ghana, <laughs> I did some. And I kept it in a dark, you've got to keep it in a dark place for about six months, nine months, 12 months. Yes. And when I got the first six months one out, I put it in five bottles. And my friend, Esom Benjamin, at that time was uh, MD for Kumasi Brewery. So I went and gave him one. Dr. Crunchy was MD for Casa Preco. So I went and gave him one. And then I gave some to some friends. And I said, ah, don't drink this thing after you have eaten fufu. No. No. Day when you've gone and had, you know, good meal. I don't say fufu is not a good meal. Fufu is lunch. This one is dinner. Then drink it after dinner. And give yourself about 45 minutes. So they all tried it. And they all came and said, but prof, we can make money. Typical Ghana. We can make money out of this. They said, mon famu sika. <laughs> I will do it. Those who come and visit me on my farm, you get a taste of it. I have nice, juicy duck. I grill duck on the farm for you. Huh? Do everything on the farm for you. And at the end of the day, you have got a taste of my liqueur. Wow. Pardon? Oh, Yali. Why, am, I, am I Obama? <laughs> <laughs> why, why, if, if me create Yali, <laughs> that all Yali should come to my house. <laughs> uh, pardon? To my farm. If you want to come to my farm, then yes. But the farm, we will divide some will work in the fish pond. <laughs> <laughs> some, some will work in the fish pond. Some, some, will, be, some, some will be with the, the, the goats. Some will be with the sheep. Some will be with their pigs. Some will be with their... Listen, you, oh yes, you have to do all that. And then in the end, in the end, we would spread. The grills will be there. And then I would bring bottles. Fantastic. It's been, it's been, it's been, it's been wonderful. Wonderful. 